Ever since they had followed him uh, down from the mountain where he preached that ethically exacting sermon and demanding sermon, it had been nonstop healing. I mean, it was wall-to-wall sick people. A man with leprosy, uh, the centurion's paralytic servant, Peter's hot mother-in-law. It says she was feverish. <laughs> A little bit better than the first time. I mean, this, uh, there you go. I just thought that was such a brilliant line and no one seems to, to pick up on it. And crowds of others, the scripture says, plagued by demons and diseases. Wall to walk sick people. Following Jesus was exhausting. It was hard work back in those early days. Others tried to join his company, you might remember, but Jesus doubted their devotion and he dismissed them almost out of hand. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests, he replied to an eager law professor. Let the dead bury the dead, he said to the son of an ailing man. If you're planning to follow me, Jesus seemed to say, then you better count the cost. From the start, it wasn't easy to follow Jesus. Nevertheless, a small band of disciples, mostly fishermen, Simon Peter, James and John, Zebedee's sons, Andrew, Peter's brother. They gathered around Jesus. They left their their families and their friends and their nets behind. So when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And onto the boat they went, weary from the crowds, grateful for a respite. Matthew is spare in his detail, but we know that Jesus must have shared their exhaustion. Because as soon as he gets on the boat and they push from shore, What happens? He falls asleep. And as relaxing as this sort of excursion must have been, I still imagine that the disciples' heads were spinning. I mean, Jesus, a miracle-working prophet, was the hottest thing to hit Palestine in a long, long time. And he had handpicked them. He had called them by name. He had promised them that they'd become fishers of men and women. Whatever that meant, it just sounded a little bit better than their day jobs presently. And clearly others envied their position. They wanted to cut in on their good thing, but Jesus deemed them somehow special. He knew them by name. And you can almost imagine the disciples in that moment as they're reflecting, sitting back on the deck of the boat, a little game of shuffleboard over here, perhaps some of those drinks with the little umbrellas. really peaceful time. Uh, Just as soon as they began to relax, all of a sudden, you heard the thunderclap and the right lightning begin to roll and the wind howls. And verse 24 says, a windstorm arose on the sea so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the situation changed from comfort to crisis. And here again, Matthew, he gives us little detail. It's very spare. But we have every reason to believe that their instincts would have kicked in and their training took over and these professional fishermen jumped to their post to save their boat. All hands on deck, they shouted, I imagine. But it was too late. The squall's too strong, the wave's too high to recover. And all of a sudden, someone realized there was someone missing. Not all hands were on deck. Jesus was absent from the scene. And in the rush to find their last and only hope, they discover him sleeping as sound as a baby. a baby in the midst of a storm, a storm into which he had led them. When Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And here's the rub. Contrary to what uh, I expect most of us believe deep, deep down, following Jesus may put your life at risk. Or at very least, it may put at risk the life you've envisioned for yourself. 
the life your parents envisioned for you, or your spouse, or your friends, or your, your colleagues at work, or your supervisor who had plans to promote you, or your pastor who counted on your leadership, or at least your tithe, or the life that you had envisioned for your own children, like my friends Mike and Brooke. Following Jesus puts our lives at risk, whether we find ourselves on a boat in Galilee, on an airplane to uh, Indonesia, or in a darkened alley in West Charlotte, where I was last night visiting some friends that live in an intentional community there among poor folks struggling to get by in our own community. Following Jesus takes us to waters where uh, we are vulnerable to storms that will lead us far, far away from the familiar, comfortable shores we know. When Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And despite his uh, disciples' sacrifices or even our own, Jesus doesn't always seem concerned or even present. The work of bringing heaven to earth that we pray for every single time we say that prayer with Jesus, that work isn't always easy, is it? It might make you go to an awful lot of trouble to serve some barbecue. (laughs) Or it might make you pile on a van and and go to rural Arkansas. Or it might take you much, much farther afield. Sometimes in ministry, whether it's helping a stranger change a flat tire or offering a prayer when God knows you hate public speaking or volunteering for VBS when you really don't like kids, shh, it's you know, a little secret, right? Sometimes it won't even feel like Jesus is on the scene or in the room or on the boat. Verse 25, the disciples went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. Where have you been, they might have been saying. Now, when the storm kicks up, the disciples rose their slumbering Savior, and then the rebukes swiftly follow. Now, I know what you're thinking. Finally, here's where we get to the good part of the story. Jesus is going to whip out the magic, and the winds and waves will will return to calm. But not so fast, Matthew says. Consider the scene in in verses 25 and, and 26. Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Jesus replies, you of little faith, why are you afraid? You of little faith? Are you serious? Come on, Jesus. I mean, talk about kicking somebody when they're down. Little faith? It's a puzzling statement. They're on the boat because of Jesus in the first place. And they've just tried to save his life. And they're having this little exchange when what's happening? The boat's sinking down. These aren't like the foxes or the birds or the guys in the two stories before that lawyer and the son of the ailing father. No, these are the folks that packed up everything and set off on the road to follow Jesus. And he led them straight into this very storm. When Jesus got into the boat, A couple of years ago, this passage, it showed up in our uh, faculty covenant group readings for the week. Now, it's a a good and funny and strange and wonderful thing to have a group of biblical scholars, a Reformation historian, a professor of preaching, a mission scholar or two in your weekly small group Bible study. It's generally a pretty fascinating and enriching thing. But on this particular day, that group of distinguished scholars was a bit stumped. You of little faith. It's not unreasonable to be scared in the midst of a storm at sea on a little boat. People die every day on the water. And this isn't some post-resurrection story with a risen Jesus who's all, you know, conquering death and all that sort of thing. No, we're early in the journey with Jesus. We're a long way from Easter in Matthew's gospel. The disciples seem downright reasonable here and dare say faithful. Waves swamping the boat, professionals that they are, they've presumably done everything possible to stabilize the boat. But fearing the worst... They turn to the one person who might be able to save them. 
And it wasn't because of his superior carpentry skills, right? Isn't that faith? They'd come to the end of their rope. They had nowhere else to turn, and they turned to Jesus. Isn't that how most of us come to Jesus? Wasn't that an act of faith? When Jesus got into the boat, you know, during my time as an urban missionary at Touching Miami with Love, I, I participated in a two-year fellowship for emerging civic leaders. It was uh, mostly bankers and lawyers, but I was kind of the token clergy person. And uh, part of that, we went on one of those outward-bound experiential learning experiences not terribly far from here up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, think uh, trust falls and rappelling and hiking, all that sort of thing, teamwork exercises. One morning, the outward-bound uh, instructors divided us into two groups. They were going to send us on a day-long hike up to the summit of the mountain we were at. And before we set out, our guy got down on a hands and knees and kind of like the circles here in the middle of the sanctuary on the floor, with a finger in the dirt, he drew three concentric circles. And he said, let me tell you a little bit, of, uh, a little bit about learning in this sort of a experience. He said, most of us like to stay in this center circle, uh, the comfort zone. And he said, that's well and good, except very, very little learning takes place in your comfort zone. He said, so you, you've got to step out beyond your comfort zone into that next concentric circle. And he said, that's a, a, a stretch zone. It's uncomfortable, but that's where you do most of your learning, except you can't keep stretching forever. There are limits on human elasticity, and if you stretch beyond that stretch zone, you'll enter a third circle, a crisis zone. And once you get there, he said, the only recourse is to move people as quickly as possible back to the comfort zone. Because their rational thought process will, will immediately break down. They will not be able to learn anything in that experience. In Matthew's Gospel, it seems as if Jesus could have benefited from my outward bound instructor's lesson. <laughs> I mean, the disciples have roused Jesus they had, they had long since entered their crisis zone. They were falling apart, perishing, as Matthew puts it. And I saw the same thing that day up on the mountain. We were headed down around dusk. Uh, camp was still a long way in the distance. Our directions were useless, turned left at the fallen tree. We were in a forest, for goodness sake. There are fallen trees in every direction, right? Uh, tempers were rising Light was fading, and then it happened. In the distance, we heard the thunder. Immediately, our trusted guide emerged from the shadows and gave us an impromptu lesson on how to survive lightning strikes in the hills. Now, I'm sure he offered some cunning method of counting echoes and timing with our watches, but... It was useless. Uh, all such insights were lost. Why? Because immediately when they heard the thunder, half of our group went to their crisis zone. <laughs> and so, trying to reason with them was useless. Even though I was pretty sure that this guy wasn't going to let a bunch of bankers and attorneys die on his watch in the woods, right? Nevertheless, it didn't matter. Almost instantly, I watched as fear spread through our group like a virus. And when the rain gently, softly began to fall on them, the, turn, the, the fear turned to panic, and people began a mad dash down the mountain in the dark. We had entered the crisis zone, and there was no return. In Matthew 8, Jesus rebukes the disciples for what seemed to me and the rest of my faculty covenant group to be a fairly faithful move. But just when all seems lost, the Jesus we so desperately want to show up finally appears. And his second rebuke, his second rebuke, is aimed not at the disciples, but at the wind and the waves. And we return to a place of peace and tranquility. But I have to believe that after those rebukes, the disciples were somehow changed. The false assurances they had believed about themselves and about this 
call to follow Jesus, to become fishers of men and women, had to be set aside. Life wasn't going to be as blissful as all of those prosperity preachers like to promise on TV. No, sometimes Jesus will lead you straight into a storm. Later in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus offers another famous rebuke. Remember Peter, get thee behind me, Satan? And immediately after that, he turns not to the crowds, but to his disciples and says, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross, and come follow me. For whoever wants to save their life must lose it, and whoever will lose their life for my sake shall find it. There is an inherent discomfort in discipleship. We, of course, want to run right to the end of the story, past the storm clouds, straight to the silver lining, past the disciples' fear of imminent death to their deliverance. We want to bask in the glory of the one whom even the wind and waves obey. But if we do that, if we jump ahead to the end of the story, to that happy ending, then we miss the good news in this passage. Namely, if Jesus gets you onto the boat, into the storm, then Jesus can get you out of it. Doesn't matter how high the waves may rage. Doesn't matter how far off course everyone else in your life or in the city of Concord thinks you've gone. If you followed Jesus onto the boat, he'll lead you home. When Jesus got into the boat, so let me ask you a question. When was the last time following Jesus made you uncomfortable? I suspect if we talk seriously about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth in Concord or West Charlotte or anywhere else, uh, Helena, Arkansas, such talk could take us into rough waters. If so, don't lose heart. Remember Paul's words to the Galatians, never grow weary in well-doing. But even when you do grow weary in well-doing, remember that the God we serve can even redeem our failures. I remember one day in Miami, uh, as I turned the corner to our urban ministry center, it struck me as I was saying this this morning, if some of you came on that trip and you remember it, we moved our center over into the midst of the neighborhood where the park was, literally across the street from uh, our park where we led a lot of summer uh, programs and after-school programs and all the families we served. So we'd moved from downtown to the midst of um, a historic African-American community. On one side was the park. On the other side of our building were housing projects overrun by drug dealers. Um, so I wasn't making up the fact that there were people in apartments that lived next door. For anyone that was keeping, you know, thinking, that would be wasted on everyone. Uh, but I remember I was driving, and I turned the corner, and I was going to pull in our parking lot, and a man over in front of the apartment started flagging me down, trying to get me over here. It's like he was directing traffic. I went ahead and parked. He was persistent, earnest. He ran over to me. As I was getting out the car, he was right there waiting for me, saying, oh, no, you want to come over here. He was trying to get me over there to buy drugs. And Listen, I was tired. Um, every day, day in and day out, we were fighting a battle for the lives of the kids in our neighborhood against the drug dealers across the street. And I just lit into him. I said, don't you have something better to do than to sling drugs on this corner every day, day and night? Don't you have something better to do? Didn't, didn't God dream bigger dreams for your life than destroying the black community from the inside out? Now, usually I didn't address the drug dealers in quite such bold fashion, and obviously, um, I don't hold this up as an example. This was not my finest missionary moment. It was not a word of grace, of, of grace. It was not an invitation. It was just sheer condemnation. Right? He's kind of taken aback. So he walked back over across the street. I went in the building, went my way. A few months later, a church group had come and we had to town, and we had taken them over to. Uh, uh, serve a meal at a homeless shelter at the Homeless Assistance Center. And we were cleaning up. We were trying to get out. Again, it was the end of the night. I was tired. I was ready to, to go. And uh, as I was helping the youth group go out the door, a man hollered from across the dining hall, Hey, Pastor Stephen. 
And I stopped and I turned. I didn't really recognize him. And he, he ran up to me and he said, hey, Pastor Stephen, do you remember me? And I kind of paused. He said, it's Charles. It's Charles. Remember from 7th Avenue, the corner. You, you asked me what I was doing with my life. Didn't God dream bigger dreams? He said, well, you were right. <laughs> and I was kind of taken aback. I said, well, let's talk for a minute, Charles. Charles said, yeah, I listened to what you said. And sure enough, I've got my life right with God now, and I, I've gotten off the street, I've come here. Uh, my girl and I, we're even getting married, he said. <laughs> And I was kind of stunned as I'm picking my jaw up off the floor. We talked for a few more minutes, and I said goodbye and parted. Never grow weary in well-doing is a good word to remember as long as we also remember that the kingdom's coming on earth as it is in heaven is a divine initiative into which the Holy Spirit invites us. And sometimes, sometimes that kingdom comes in spite of us. Now, I don't presume to know what this passage means for you personally or for Miguel Baptist Church collectively, but I do know that when Jesus got into the boat, so let me close with the challenge. Pay attention to those folks in your life uh, who have embraced the call to follow Jesus into, uh, into the storm, out of their comfort zones, away from familiar shores, where it's the same Jesus who was willing to take on the form of a slave and become obedient unto death, even death on a cross, for our salvation. Maybe those people are missionaries, like my friends in Indonesia, or like the other people in North Carolina I've mentioned, or the folks in in Arkansas, or the Ackers we prayed for, um, and Sarah, I don't know if that was Sarah Williams we were talking about, who was in South Africa. They come in all shapes and sizes and colors and accents, and they may be car salesmen or custodians, they may be school teachers or, or pastors, they may be all sorts of different people from all sorts of walks of life. They could be undocumented immigrants, or they could be uh, epidemiologists at the CDC close to where I live. But the one thing they share in common is a willingness to embrace the discomfort of discipleship because that's precisely where the real growth occurs. If we're willing to take that risk, then we'll find that there is no safer, no happier place to be than with Jesus, even in the midst of a storm. When Jesus got into the boat. Thanks be to God and amen. You have heard the word of God, and now we respond to the word of God. It is an invitation, an invitation in your life to follow the one who brings us into the boat to be his church, to be his people. Know that Jesus Christ indeed is Lord. And we invite you to understand that and to know that we invite you to come and join us in our congregation as we work together to do his kingdom here and now. As we stand and sing, the old rugged cross. May we stand and sing.
What a good day to be at McGill. We were very happy that uh, Steve stayed over from the meeting in Charlotte, and uh, he's got a new baby. How old? Five weeks. Five weeks old. Well, you did get some sleep then, last night, the night before. <laughs> And that's his second child, but we appreciate him taking that time away to be with us this morning and to share in such a powerful way God's message and God's love. I'm going to ask him to come down here and after the service, if you'll come and let him know how much you appreciate his ministry, his work, and all that he has done. Were you, did, Philip, did you go to Miami? I didn't get it. You didn't get it? Okay. I was trying to think. Anybody with us with us today? That, was, that group was probably uh, different places. <laughs> I was trying to think where they would be. So. Steve Jr.'s in Miami. <laughs> I mean, not Miami, he's in Mount Airy. <laughs> a pretty big difference. Yeah, Mount Airy and Mount Airy. <laughs> well, that's a few miles. Again, what a wonderful area. This is the week of the barbecue. Uh, I, I was at a breakfast the other week, and uh, I had to put a commercial in for our barbecue, and I said that uh, they would throw me out of Princeton, so I, could, I had to disallow this. I did not learn this at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, but, I, you know, the Bible very well says, Jesus says, and man shall not live by bread alone. You need barbecue. <laughs> You need barbecue. That's the rest of that story. Now you know. So come and share the barbecue. And uh, we'll see everybody all this week. It's going to be a great week to be here at church. And then we'll look forward to it. It's good. But it reminds us we do those things. So many more things can be done. And this is part of what we do. So now go into this world. A world that God has so loved. That he sent his only son. A world that God has so loved that he sends you. He sends you and me to share that love, to be that love, to embrace his world. Go into that world and be who you need to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you again for joining us for our March 22nd worship service here at McGill Baptist Church. McGill Baptist Church is at 5300 Popper 10 Road in Concord, North Carolina. Our phone number is 704-788-1180 and our website address is www.mcgillbaptist.org. Thank you again for joining us and again, have a blessed day.